on a limb Welcome to Proglodytes Radio. My name is Arthur. And I'm Thomas. And uh, we're here to talk about some prog news for the week, but uh, also the astonishing. Yeah, if you're a pro- progressive rock or metal fan, then surely you have heard Dream Theater's new album, The Astonishing. So we're going to be talking about that today. But before we get into that, uh, prog fans are rejoicing everywhere that Haken's new album, Affinity, has been announced. And some of you may have seen on the website, there was that computer interface thing, and it said, for some reason, Verbatim was the fake album title. But, nope, it ended up being called Affinity. So, we're looking forward to seeing, hearing that album and seeing where they end up going on tour. That's definitely a so, show that uh, I'd like to I see. Question, I have a question about that, Thomas. Yeah. How popular is Haken? Because you told me about Haken and you showed me some songs, and my kids like their songs, especially the puppet song. Cockroach AKA, King. Yeah, a.k.a. Cockroach King. Uh, but I have no frame of reference in terms of how popular are they. Like, what tier? It's hard to know. Because... You know, it's it's it seems obvious, but when you're a music fan and you love your artist so much, and then you find out how little a lot of these guys make. You know, we talked last episode or two episodes ago, maybe about Devin Townsend and how little mu- mu- money he actually makes. It's just kind of shocking. So you think, you know, gosh, you know, it, it may be that. I know for a fact that the one of the members, maybe the drummer, is like a tuba instructor somewhere. <laughs> oh man! So well, I'm just talking. Maybe it would be more helpful to talk about market share. Like, if there's a pie chart with like the biggest prog bands, are they like visible? I would say uh, if you're a progressive metal fan, you have heard of Haken. I don't okay. know what that ends up meaning. I think The Mountain was a big hit. A lot of people said it was their prog album of the year. I love it. Um, and a lot of I've just seen a lot of buzz about this new album on progressive rock websites. Okay. Well, that kind of answers my question. Because I, I, I mean, the reason I ask is because... Um, the reason I ask is, like, after you showed me them... Like I saw, started seeing their name everywhere. So now I'm thinking, well, maybe they're really super popular, but I don't know. Yeah, prog popular and real popular are two different things. True. Yeah, so another news item, the great Rick Wakeman is re-recording his album. He's actually doing a Pledge Music campaign. If you've ever seen Pledge Music before, it's a way that you can pledge a certain quantity of uh, money and different artists have done it so you pledge for different items or different things but um, he yeah they're remaking the uh, myths and legends of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table so are they so are they going to do an on ice version (laughs) I hope so that'd be great I just I, I feel like the gestalts would not be complete without you know an ice show. Well, yeah, or they could update it to the 21st century and be hoverboards or something. Yeah, that's true. Everything bursts into flames. <laughs> Everyone's on segways and hoverboards and there's a huge pyrotechnics show. And they have holograms. Speaking of <laughs> speaking of nerdy technology. Dude, wait, <laughs> whatever happened to holograms, man? Holograms was like firmly in the 80s and 90s, and we thought that everything was going to be holograms, and then they just disappeared. Well, there's a lot of things about holograms that you'd think it might be a good idea to have a hologram. Like, if you're talking to somebody on the phone, you're like, (laughs) man, it'd be so nice to see a hologram of their face. But instead, we have Skype, (laughs) you know, and FaceTime. You think it would be better for me to be looking at a hologram of you right now rather than just like a 3D image? I guess I'm saying it's one of those things that it sounds great 
you know, like for a futurist on paper or whatever. But when you actually think about like, which is better seeing a hologram of your friend's face or just seeing a 2d image of your friend's face, it doesn't make the hologram really <laughs> worth it. You know? Okay. <laughs> It's True. like it's like okay. flying cars, you know. If we were to get the flying car like everybody wants, the number one logistical problem with a flying car is if the engine stops working, you pretty much die. Yeah, everyone would die if there were flying cars. There's no safety mechanism that would save people. Everyone would just die. Or, you know, even if you don't die, it a parachute or something or, you know, every outcome of an a mechanical failure of a flying car would end in something horrible. So, yeah. Now, holograms were used to recreate Tupac in a in a concert a few years back. I think it was Coachella, maybe? I don't know. They I'm did. not much of a Tupac fan. Yeah, well, he released a three-CD album a few years back that was a progressive... I'm just making this up. It's not true at all, actually. He oh. was not. He was not a progressive rap artist. No, you he was, suck. Yeah, I know. All right, but so, you know, our next president, I predict, will be a hologram. Oh uh, yeah, probably. I hope so. It would be better than a lot of the people we have running. Oh, zing! This this, this podcast has taken a turn for the political. You thought you could avoid it by listening to this podcast, but no. The only, we are a, we're a single issue podcast. We we only care about what candidates think about progressive rock. Yeah, that's why I'm a John Huntsman fan. He is a big big fan of progressive rock. So much so that he declared a Dream Theater Day in Utah when he was governor. Yeah, that was dope. Yeah, it was dope. Okay. Also, he's a hologram. He may be a hologram. Okay, that's how, let's, that's, that uh, okay, his so impeccable tan. The uh, <laughs> he does have a nice tan. That's yeah. true. He's not just an olive skinned dude. He's a he's a historic Mormon, so there's got to be something going on. Yeah, something going on. So okay, wait. So anything else about Rick Wakeman? Just check out the pledge music and um and pledge. And if he gets, you know, millions of dollars of, of budget, maybe we will see uh, the myths and legends of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table on Ice, like many of us have always wanted. Totally. Okay. Next item of business. Now it's time. It is time for The Astonishing. I, I, I wish we had some really awesome music, some really astonishing music to lead us into this part. I think I think we would need more than 30 listeners to uh, justify <laughs> spending the money to buy the rights of a clip of Dream Theater. No, we, okay, remember on our first episode we said we needed sound effects? Let's just yeah. get one that's like... Bum, ba, da, da, da. Here. Okay, fanfare. All right, so we'll have a pause, and then... <laughs> we'll have a pause, and then when we finally do the podcast, we will interject this sound effect right before we say it right before we say the astonishing yeah all right <laughs> so <laughs> one <laughs> two three blank silence <laughs> ladies and gentlemen now we are going to talk about the astonishing the 34 song long song long album long by dream song. theater the song is long <laughs> <laughs> yes um, one of the most ambitious progressive rock albums of modern times. Dude, of all time. Here's the thing. Say what you want about prog rock, but ambition is just part of it. So if you're going to say it's an ambitious prog album, that's really saying something. True. Yeah, it's ambitious among ambitiousness. Yeah. So... Yeah, this is a pretty, <clears throat> just as far as context goes, we can talk a little bit about context of this album. It was mainly conceived by John Petrucci, who decided he would write this massive rock opera. He wrote most of it. It was produced by David Campbell. There is a full orchestra. There is a massive choir. There is 
a website, an interactive website. There have been there's been a really intense press campaign. It's and one of the most interesting things about it is that it's received pretty favorable coverage in mass music media. Whereas previously, you know, Dream Theater and Progressive Metal has been maligned by, you know, for all the for all the reason you'd expect. Like it's actually been pretty well reviewed. I think on Metacritic, which is an aggregator uh, aggregator website for media, it got like an eighty out of a hundred, which that's pretty hard to get. So yeah, just- especially like right away because sometimes these things have to like the true influence or the you know it has to kind of sink in for everybody for a couple of years before people like reappraise it later so the fact that it's like doing so well right out of the starting gate is pretty pretty amazing or astonishing <laughs> man it took me like 12 minutes to get there yeah that's a astonishing joke astonishing <laughs> astonishing <laughs> um, i'll uh i'll go ahead and download a cricket um <laughs> sound to uh mix into there anytime we try to make an astonishing joke it should be followed with a cricket <laughs> <laughs> i am gonna do that now you should or a toilet flushing or a uh, slide whistle so some more context it's a story album as you'd imagine this is from the wikipedia summary The Astonishing is set in a dystopian United States and follows the Ravenskill Militia, a band of rebels, in their efforts to defy the great northern empire of the Americas using the magical power of music. So, the two major characters are Gabriel, who is the... He's this guy in this little town that realizes that he has magical music powers in a future where music is outlawed and creation of music is done by robots... And the bad guy's name is Lord Nefarious. Which, nefarious. Nefarious. Which sounds, you know, when you're thinking of politicians you can trust. I'm sure he, you know, may have faced some opposition. Who voted for that guy? I know. Who votes for a guy named Nefarious? Yeah, well, yeah, Nefarious is the evil dude. Now, I will admit, when when this first came out, Before we knew any of this stuff, Dream Theater's website, it said, pick your clan or something like that. And it had the Ravenskill Militia, which is Gabriel and his people. And then it had the Great Northern Empire, which is Lord Nefarious. It had both of those. And I ended up picking the Great Northern Empire just because, (laughs) um, yeah, I think music should be outlawed and replaced by robots called Nomax. Like, okay, but Nefarious turns out to be a good guy, though. Um, does he? Yeah. You didn't listen to all 34 songs. <laughs> Maybe. No, because at the end, he, like, shuts the Nomax down and... That's right. Okay, so it's a redemption story. Yes. Yeah, okay, because after Gabriel... We're just giving away all the amazing plot points that you pick up after your, you know, two-hour intense listening. Um, it's a little convoluted. Yeah, there's a lot of plot points. We There's a lot of moving pieces. Exactly. But that's right, because he has a daughter, Faith, that falls in love with Gabriel, and he gets really mad. And um, Anyway, you ought to just read. <laughs> if you're not interested at all in listening to the album, you ought to just read the Wikipedia, and you'll see how interesting of a story it is <clears throat> let's get to the music let's talk about the music well i wanted to talk about um just like okay so that leads us to the complexity of the story so <clears throat> you can cut out my, my let's talk about the music thing <laughs> yeah i'll just cut that out or just leave it in no um, come on all right go for it i'm thinking that this album should not be judged the same as another album because it seems like it's so ambitious and involves so many tie-ins from different media. It just seems like you can't just apply the same, I don't know, hermeneutic that you used to judge, you know, like close to the edge and apply it to this. Just because it's so long? 
just, I mean, it's not I'm just, just lame. It's like they have, yeah, they've intentionally created something that's like incredibly complex and I don't know. You just, I just don't think of this as like a regular album. Oh no. This is like halfway an album slash HBO miniseries. Right. Yeah. It's a rock opera and it follows a lot of the forms of the rock opera. There's overtures, there's weird instrumental breaks that kind of give you breathers in between plot points. There are songs that are just, you know, um, not really cohesive song structure type songs. They're just advancement of the plot type songs. So I think I agree with you there. I, 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 I heard a review that said the astonishing is a five out of five. If you're a prog metal fan and a three out of five, if you're a regular person, um, <laughs> just because I think that you kind of have to, you kind of have to, I don't know. You really have to prepare yourself for this album. It's not... I, I tried to listen... I, I probably listened to it maybe 10 times all the way through. Sometimes close listening, sometimes just in the background at work while I'm working on stuff. But it's not really something you can just have in the background. It's really involved and active and very busy. Yeah, so it's almost like the normal mode of music listening is not going to work here. Because you can't have it in the background. Um, you can't, like... It doesn't seem to make a lot of sense to listen to songs individually. Like, just because there are story arcs, you kind of have to listen at least a few at a time. But then, like, when do you have time to sit down and listen to two hours of music? Right. So it's like they're challenging you to, like, figure out a way to schedule this <laughs> into your life. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. It's, they're going on tour, and I'm intending on seeing them. Tickets for what I saw were about sixty bucks. Um, Dang. So, but they're going to they're going to perform the entire album with media in the background. Honestly, a couple things. I'm going to be going to one of the first shows, so it'll be cool to see James Labrie sing all of these parts. Um, because he's do he plays every character, so seeing him just being every single different character will, and hearing him, and while his voice is still good, I, I just imagine this tour will be just epically difficult for for everyone involved. I mean, for a couple reasons. I mean, the fact that it's so musically complex, but also just thir thir you know thirty four songs every night, and he has to like he actually intentionally. Uh, shifted his vocal timbre in order to be different characters, right? Yeah. So, yeah, if you listen to it, he does a great job. If we get into just the musical, just talking about the musical aspect of the album, I think he is the MVP of the album. Just because I already hold John Petrucci at such a high standard. John Mayung, you know, he's never really done a bass line that's totally unimpressive. He's a great bassist. Um, Mike Mangini just, you know, he's a solid drummer all around, one of the best. Um, Jordan Rudis has a, I, I like, I don't hold any of them. They're already at the standard in my mind. But James Labrie always seemed like the weakest link for a lot of people. He's a, he's like a hang up for a lot of listeners that say, oh well, you know. But to me, I'm just like nobody could have pulled this off like he did. To be honest, he's he's the Billy West of <laughs> Prague for this album. Yes. So, totally impressed with his work. He's just all over the place. Yeah, so I um, I was thinking, one of the notes that I wrote down while I was listening was, and this is a question for you, Thomas. Do you feel like there was creative... Um, do you think there was a problem uh, created by the fact that John Petrucci had so much creative input and... My young didn't seem to have as much, or the drummer um, Mike Mangini didn't have as much. Do you feel like that might have presented a kind of a problem in the creative diversity? So, there, when Peter Gabriel and Genesis did that documentary, where they interviewed uh, the entire band and talked about the limelight down on Broadway and different things like that, and I'm going to butcher the quote. It's a great quote, but he said. No great novel was ever written by committee. And I th always thought that was a great point. It's like, it's one thing if you're writing an album worth of music, which 
would be hard for me. You've done it before, and you know it's difficult. But when you you have full say and you know your parameters and all that stuff, it's it's a lot easier than like if you're taking on something so huge, like having each person being like, no, I think that <laughs> Nefarious should kill him in this song, or you know, like it would just. I think I think that there's a functional aspect to that. That's probably true because I think about there's actually behavioral research about that because they did this study where they had um, like people that answered trivia either in small groups or individually. And when you put people in groups and they all have to um, answer the trivia questions uh, as a group, they they get the answer wrong more often. Because it's just like every time you think of something and you think that you're right, um, you you have to pass it uh, by every person in the group. And then it like there's a high likelihood that somebody's going to be like, "Ah, I don't know about that. And then you're going to not want to bring up what you know. So I think you're right. So and also I think that John Mayung especially, but Mike Mangini now, they... Mike Bangini was just a guy who was an incredible drummer, had worked just ridiculously hard to get his chops up. I don't get the impression that he got into Dream Theater with this idea that he's going to become this prolific songwriter for them. I think he was he's more of a guy that says, I'm going to do exactly what this song needs. I think he's a fabulous musician in that sense, but he, you know, he's done so much studio work that he really focuses. I mean, on the album, a lot of people complain. He's, they're just like, oh, Portnoy had so much more personality and character. But Mike Mangini, I feel like he plays exactly what the song needs in every song. So much so that it's, I won't say that his drum parts are unremarkable because they're amazing and he does all sorts of really cool things. But they just fit the song so well that they don't like, I don't know. He's Rango. He's like an insanely talented, <laughs> super just... I mean, it, yeah, he just does what the song requires. Okay, so you, I guess part of me is like, okay, so the story involved here is a little cheesy, a little complex. It definitely doesn't break any ground in terms of like, oh, you know, a dystopian world where creativity is looked look down upon. Like, You're right. You know, all the guys in Dream Theater listened to 2112 as kids, so they know that this isn't a new concept. But right. that having been said, I, I wonder if maybe some of the other band members could have uh, had a little more input, creative input. It might have, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just, that's just a hypothetical, really. What may and I think of, and I, the other thing I thought about was uh, James Labrie his creativity is just just is poured out in his vocals right i guess that's that's kind of my point um i feel like good music is written when you're given you're given parameters um and and a lot of expression happens like that's a the other aspect you know there's the writing aspect but then there's the expression aspect like and i feel like that's kind of how dream theater has been lately is there's it seems like Jordan Rudis and, and Job Drucci get together and write and then they present it to the band And but it's not like play this and hit a crash here and do a bass ostinato here it's like here's what we're doing and then do a part that matches this really perfectly and in the case of you know Mike Mangini specifically he he they say he d- does things or he picks up on things that just nobody else could have really thought of like he'll follow with his right hand like the bass line and he'll follow like the keyboard line with his left hand or something like that you know do like ridiculously complex stuff like that yeah so okay so here's another observation that i made and this is about the music um i feel like it sounds so good in terms of like production quality oh yeah so i think that one of the criticisms that i've seen of of dream theater and i'm not sure this was uh fair but especially back in the 90s when um, they kind of were the only ones doing what they did. I, I heard a lot of people say that the production quality made it seem really stale and robotic. So like just the the drums just sounded so perfect and they were triggered at the beginning. But um, And then the guitar just seemed really, I don't know, it just seemed very stock. And what I found about this is 
it's still high production, but it sounds so good. Like the orchestra, the guitar tones sound so much. Uh, it's still John Petrucci tone, but it sounds so much smoother and punchier and thicker. Thicker. I don't know how he did it. I wonder if they had to mix it differently to fit in with the orchestra. I bet. And that just gave it a, a different tone. But I, I love it. I thought it sounds so good. Yeah, because it looks like it was produced by John Petrucci still. He's, he's produced a lot of their albums. But having David Campbell involved to write the orchestra parts, you know, there was, there's so much, and choir parts. I mean, not just orchestra, but choir. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I think I think you're right. It, I think that sonically it's, it's amazing. As far as just song by song, I think some of my favorites, I think The Gift of Music is a great song. Um, that's kind of the first full song. Uh, they're, and that's kind of the one they're pushing as their um, the single of the album, and it's just sort of like a presentation of what's going on throughout the album. But it has a very rush vibe, kind of like a upbeat, you know, p- positive sound, and, and a lot of really cool instrumental passages and 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 syncopated rhythms and different things like that. So, um, what are we can go we can go you and me and we can name off our favorite tracks okay yeah because i did write down a few now i have to preface this by saying this album is intimidating oh yeah and (laughs) i've listened to it straight through two times but as far as like remembering what the names of tracks were and uh you know following the story i really like to let this type of an album sink in for a long long time like i right. don't feel i don't feel like i really understood scenes from a memory till like 2 years later so the idea of going through the astonishing and knowing it you know a few weeks later is just impossible cuz there might be <clears throat> typical to a rock opera there might be a 2 minute passage that's awesome in a song that's you know 6 minutes or 7 minutes and it's kind of a cinematic sequence throughout the album. So it's not quite like, oh, I, you know, it's not it's not as easy to say. Um, or you, you may be listening to it and say, oh, that passage is really cool, but not know where it was or whatever else. Yeah, so, all right, so with that caveat, there were some um, moments that I kind of made a note of and then I wrote down what the song was. So, for instance... Uh, the song A New Beginning. I love that song. Yeah, that's okay, one of my that, favorites too. Yeah, that's a great one. And the guitar solo, uh, that really jumps out at me. Of course, John Petrucci left a lot of room for himself to just write awesome guitar <laughs> solos. Um, but I thought that was that was great, and it's one of the the examples of like just great sounding guitar tone. Yeah, it's a really upbeat song. It's got this stilted, uh, odd type signature chorus. It's just really catchy. Like right now, I can think of it in my head. When you listen to 34 <laughs> songs, it's you know it's a challenge to have things that stand out. Um, I went showed one of my friends a big long prog song, and he said, "Dude, I did not hear one hook <laughs> in that entire like 11 minute song. I didn't hear one hook." But I feel like there are a lot of hooks on on this album. There are several songs. I think the gift of music has a catchy chorus and a catchy melody. And I think the new beginning is one that really kind of sticks out in my head as one that just has this really upbeat sort of thing that gets stuck in your head. Arthur and I have discussed in the past what makes a good prog song and it's equal parts, you know, the ambitiousness or the boldness or whatever, the audacity and just plain old good melody. What makes any song good? And that's just that just gives you a little bit of my bias because. I I have to have a catchy something. I have to be able to just get something that sinks into my head that I'm whistling later or I'm humming to myself. And if I don't have that, you know, it's very hard for me to get into a prog album, no matter how amazing it is. Right, yeah. Long, awesome, noodly instrumental passages kind of get old in a, in a field where that's so common. Moment of Betrayal, do you like that one? I thought that was another really good one. I didn't write it down, and uh, I can't remember that one. Uh, there, um, moment of betrayals, kind of. It's a. Is it acoustic? A, no, it's it's. I think there were two singles released. It was gifted music, a moment of betrayal. Um, anytime um, nefarious comes on, there's like this queen vibe too. 
I I like when Nefarious comes on early on. You know, like there's this part where he comes on and it's just sort of like I'm Lord Nefarious and I'm really evil. And I you just imagine him like popping into the court, you know, the court, and all like the lords and ladies like look over at him and he's like this evil guy. And then he's like, "You have three days to figure this out." And then you hear him like James will be laughing like this evil laugh yes, for like thirty I wrote seconds. That down. <laughs> yeah, that song is called Three Days. Yeah, and he's like, ah, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, it's it's only in this format that <laughs> that could happen, and not, you know, that just... song reminded me of um, what's the uh, the one on Six Degrees? That's uh, the test that stumped them war- all. No, no, no. Uh, war- I was thinking War Inside My Head. Da 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 da. That's what that reminded me of, anyway. Yeah, a little bit. Having said that, I think that the whole album reminds me a lot of Six Degrees of Inner Turbulence. Because Six Degrees of Inner Turbulence did have this sort of symphonic vibe to it. I agree and, with that. And the production is similar. I think it's a longer, much longer form version. So, on the very end of the album, there's another really catchy song called um, Our New World. We'll okay, I did. A new world. I did write that one down. But I don't remember it. I just wrote it that it was it's, good. It's like we it, it, the the chorus is just a kind of a catchy thing. It's like we'll build a new world. Da, 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 da. Yeah, um, I guess at the very end when nefarious. We're spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> I know, I know you're totally disappointed. Close so your you could ears. Just, close your ears and count to ten. All if you don't three want of you. All two of you. Um, yeah, so when they decide, you know, maybe we should maybe we should let people listen to music that they want instead of shoving music down their throat with these giant robot musical creator machines. That is um, so true though. It's true, yeah. You should let people listen to what they want. That's instead just, of if you're a good, sh- if you want to be a good king, let them sh- listen to what they yeah. want. Yeah. And if you spend a ton of money, you know, building these robots that create, you know, white noise and fly around you know, something bad's going to happen. I'm just letting you know. Think about this, okay? So in their fiscal budget, they have this huge chunk devoted just to building the Nomax, right? I'm sure. Yeah, so just kill the Nomax and just uh, let the free market take over the music stuff and then tax the market. Yeah, because I know, you know, you you have this giant rift, you're dealing with militias. You don't have time to, you know, fund fund worthless projects. So it's good that they did. They probably the underpinnings of Act 2 is probably an extensive policy research team, you know, recognizing cost benefit and eliminating the what ends up being a pretty worthless program. I'm pretty sure um that John Petrucci could have benefited from like an economic consultant. Yeah, I think so, too. Because, uh, you know, he got the guy to write strings for him, but he didn't even ask anyone about tax policy or anything. It's kind of weird. Yeah. Okay, so on a scale of something to something or other, how good is the astonishing to you, Thomas? So on a scale of something to something, I would say long answer is Arthur and I have talked about how important dream theater was in our musical development it's not you know the band that i'm the most excited to hear or see right now in my life but i still view it as an important an important part of my musical development Uh, having said that they kind of lost me i stopped listening really intensely or really closely around train of thought and those next couple albums they just seemed really kind of unremarkable to me and with each album since Portnoy has left I, Black Clouds and Silver Lining wasn't super interesting to me um, The Dramatic Turn of Events was a little more interesting to me Dream Theater the self-titled was a little more interesting to me The Astonishing it seemed like everything was going against it as far as being a good album it just seemed too, super cheesy. It seemed totally overblown and pretentious and all the things that make prog good slash bad. I ended up really liking it. So I would say that qualified answer is, um, like, as a lifelong Dream Theater fan, I'm happy that now I enjoy listening to Dream Theater, if that makes sense. 
Makes total sense. I would concur with your assessment. So I would say that this is um, on a scale of 1 to 13. <laughs> okay, I can't think like that. But it's, uh, in base, it's in base 8? Yeah. So if I were to say uh, in binary, this okay. would be a 1001110. One, zero, zero, one, 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 zero, zero. I'm just joking. I don't know binary. We'll have to look that up. Yeah, <laughs> we'll have to. You, I might have just said the, the word. F word or something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I would say that I agree with the conglomerate ratings that this is an 8 out of 10. And I would say that my favorite albums are still going to be Scenes from a Memory, Falling into Infinity, Images and Words, um, and probably I'm going to say if you count A Change of Seasons, I'd probably go with that. But this would be right on the tails of the classic canon of Dream Theater for me. I would agree. I, I like it better than Six Degrees. I have a soft spot for Six Degrees, I think, because of when I was listening to it. You know, a lot of memories or nostalgia tied into it. So Six Degrees is the last album that I really liked. I would probably place it um, just as a full album. It, it, you're right. They talked about how this the astonishing isn't just you know a casual product project like they were saying this could turn into a lot of other things so it's almost like it seems weird to put this next to an album like falling into infinity um like this is the same band that wrote you not me <laughs> um yeah well they kind of did yeah right <laughs> or even you know a lot of those songs on there um so it's almost like it's in a league of its own you might want to compare it. I, the closest they've ever come is Scenes from a Memory. And I, I think that Scenes from a Memory is super solid from start to finish. But I don't think this is that far off from Scenes from a Memory in my book. Really? Just as far as what it's able to achieve. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think I, I'm super impressed. I'll I'll keep listening for a couple months, really. And uh, it'll sink in. It'll have to sink in. Uh, you know, I... It's really hard to just judge something like this right out of the gate. So I'm going to say... Well, here's the other thing. I think I think Scenes from Memory revealed itself to me when I saw the DVD, which, weirdly, that was the case. Like, I, I watched... We, we bought that DVD when we were teenagers. Um, I remember us watching it as a family. Um, yeah, our family's cooler than yours. <laughs> <laughs> we watched it as a family. Or, Dude, you know, and, the, and the weird thing about the... Uh, the stage show was it started out with that um the hypnotherapist is like yep <laughs> lay down and relax <laughs> I always, Close that, your like, eyes and it. relax <laughs> yeah it's true um anyway uh, watching it on stage it revealed it in a way that i you know so i think the, the the astonishing will do the same that when when i go and see dream theater in a theater and they have a huge multimedia presentation, and James Lebrie is hopping around like freaking a, a holograms everywhere. Yeah, holograms, holograms everywhere. Hoverboards, segways, um, <laughs> drones, drones. <laughs> <laughs> what if they have like drone flying Nomax going around, just flying around the audience, <laughs> like emitting the? That's a okay. really good idea. I think so. I hope they're listening. Yeah. Um, I know they are. I this will is going say, up on their official Facebook. I know. I'm it. sure it is. I, here's maybe one of our final points. And this is an issue of discussion among a lot of fans of this album. The There are no max instrumentals interspersed throughout the album. Some people have argued that they are good because they serve a function. It allows you to breathe in between 34 songs. Other people have just said, why did you put in weird robot noises in between songs? What's your take on it? Because for me, it was sort of distracting. I think it might have been a little much, but I feel a little bit of ambivalence in terms of, okay, so Chroma Key, he included a lot of like soundscape type stuff. 
And it's almost like I don't go back and listen to those songs like standalone. But in terms of contributing to the feel of the album, it worked because nobody sounds like Chroma Key. And what he does with sounds and, and washes and electronic instruments is so unique that I'm very forgiving with that stuff. Sure. Just because it just contributes to the overall tone. Um, and in today's era, like if we were still listening um, on vinyl record, which, you know, maybe we are, but we can skip anything we want. And we can make a playlist on Spotify and do it in whatever order we want. So, you know, if you hate it, then just don't listen. That's how I see it anyway. I agree with the breather thing. I think it does kind of hit the reset button. But still, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not crazy about the weird noises. Um, I guess just because I've listened to other musicals like Jesus Christ Superstar or different things like that. And I think it... Um, it seemed it, it it doesn't advance the narrative in in a way that I think is helpful for me as a listener. But what if I what if I told you that I thought those songs were the best? What if the songs that I named off that were my favorites all were the Nomax songs? What would you say? I would say I knew you were Lord Nefarious. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was you. That explains so much. Dude, what if Nefarious composes those songs? Like he's a drum and bass, like house music guy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like tri- he's a dub stepper. <laughs> it would make a lot of sense. They, if you look on the website, they're all pretty fashionable. I mean, guy, Nefarious looks like he could be sixty years old or something. Dude's got some nice hair. Very fashionable. He, 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 they have good uh, plastic surgery and you know stylists in the future too. Right, you're not listening to music. You're getting Nomac music all the time. You know, you got other things to focus on, like great swoopy bangs and looking awesome with armor and stuff, even though it's probably not super necessary. All right, man. Well, I think that's a pretty good wrap up of The Astonishing. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I think so, too. It was a long discussion about a long album. Arthur and I may not agree on every album we talk about in these re- reviews but i think we're both sort of in agreement on this one that it's um maybe not the greatest thing that dream theater has ever done but one we hold it to a different standard because of its level of ambition and two it's better than a lot of the things they put out throughout the thousands so bam we we give it a two progs up we give it a g plus <laughs> on a scale of A to P. Yeah, I like that. Okay. All right, so thank you for listening to Proglodytes Radio this week. I am Arthur. And I am Thomas. Go prog yourself. <laughs>